The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post test at peerview.com forward slash SVU 860. Downloadable infographics and additional resources are also available. Thank you for listening to Peerview Podcasts. We greatly appreciate your support and would like to hear from you. Can we ask for a favor? Participate today in a short one minute survey at www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to share how podcasts play a role in your medical education routine. Again, that's www.peerview.com forward slash podcast survey to participate. And now on to today's podcast. Hi, this is Lucia Novak. I am a board certified nurse practitioner in both adult health and advanced diabetes management. I am the owner of Diabetes Consulting Services located in North Bethesda, Maryland, and I am also the co-executive director for the Capital Health and Metabolic Center of the Capital Diabetes and Endocrine Associates practice in Silver Spring, Maryland. Welcome to this educational activity entitled The Art of Medicine, Creating Treatment Regimens with GLP-1 receptor agonists to reduce cardiovascular risks in patients with type 2 diabetes. So let's start. The ADA's most recent guidelines has an emphasis placed on the importance of shared decision-making. And so it's very important to understand what shared decision-making is and how important it is to actually achieving the goal with the patient, which will also empower them to be part of the team. We know that if we involve the patient and get their buy-in on whatever treatment plan we may have in mind as clinicians, that that will assist and empower the patient to be participating in accomplishing those goals, which actually will help with reduction of the complications that we see associated with diabetes, but also optimize their own quality of life, especially if they feel that they have a voice in what we're trying to do. This is a questionnaire that shows what some beliefs patients may have about medication use. And so they can be very specific to the medication itself. For instance, my health at present depends on my medicines or what they're concerned about as far as they're afraid that their medications will actually make them feel sick or that their disease would be worse if they weren't on them. The other flip of that is how do they perceive the medications as fitting into their life? Do they feel that they're on just too many? Diabetes is one of those buy one, get three free diseases. And so it's not just diabetes that we're managing. It's usually the hypertension and the dyslipidemia. So the medication burden can build quite quickly for our patients. And so understanding their beliefs and their concerns and perhaps culturally how medications fit into their life is very important to overall adherence as well as persistence with medications. A lot of clinicians actually believe that there just really isn't enough time for shared decision making. And what I have found is that you can really integrate it into the conversation with your patient. It doesn't have to be a formal conversation per se. That simple question, what is the biggest thing getting in your way right now? is a key way for us as clinicians to actually start the shared decision-making conversation with them. It allows the patient to feel safe, that they can actually give us a truthful answer on what's really going on. And I have a clock in my office, and above the clock, the acronym WAIT, W-A-I-T, and it stands for Why Am I Talking? We ask the questions, but we need to allow our patients to kind of Take in that question, digest it, and then answer it in their own words. Allowing them to tell their story is very important. We do know that shared decision-making will improve satisfaction with care because if the patient believes that they've had a say in how we're going to move forward with their treatment plan, they're more likely to stick with it because they were part of coming up with that decision. 
a nationally representative survey using the medical expenditure panel survey of non-institutionalized United States population, so those that are not in the hospital, looked at access to care, health services use, as well as health care expenditures. And what we saw was that 38 percent of those who were sampled perceived that having that shared decision making was very important and it was associated with a 40 percent increase in satisfaction with their care compared to those who did not perceive shared decision making to be an integral part of that visit. We also were able to see that lower levels of shared decision making were associated with the patients being older, being male, or even uninsured. And so we need to keep that in mind because we want to make sure that we're involving that population even more so. We do have some tools available that should help the clinician with shared decision making. It just depends on the clinician's preference as well as what the patient prefers to do. Shared decision making is really integral to all chronic disease management. And so we really want you all to take advantage of what's available out there so that we can develop those skills a little better and make it so that it is a natural part of what we do when we're speaking with our patients. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our patient, Ms. Deborah Barr, who is going to share her perspective with us throughout today's presentation. My name is Deborah Barr. I have been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes 20 years ago when I was pregnant with my first child and the doctor did a fasting blood sugar test on me and that's when they found out that I had type 2 diabetes. My diabetes care provider is outstanding. They know that I enjoy being very informed. I like the fact that they explain everything to me prior to starting something new. Um, they take me where I am, they know where I want to go, and they help me to get there. And I'm telling you all, Ms. Novak, she, me and my husband both came in um, together when I met her. And she kept, she, she talked to us both so that we could both understand exactly how important it was to get my goals met. And so that I just truly, truly appreciate it. So that definitely has helped me along the way because you know i've had diabetes for 20 years i haven't had a lot of success in in the past but now i am definitely seeing some great results So now let's move on to assessing the patient characteristics. What's important about glycemic control is that we know that every 1% reduction in hemoglobin A1C, whether the patient has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, has made a profound impact on the microvascular complications. What has been disappointing is that there really hasn't been anything that showed an impact on the macrovascular or cardiovascular complications. Even though glycemic control does not directly impact the macrovascular complications, when patients are experiencing suboptimal glucose control, it can make those underlying cardiovascular risks and established disease worse. And the other point that I must hammer in on is that typically our patients with type 1 diabetes, they don't present with a lot of disease burden and complications, whereas our patients with type 2 diabetes do. But we have enough data that if we are to intervene with glycemic control early in the disease process, when they're more likely to be able to tolerate the regimen and do better with it, 
we actually can impart something called metabolic memory or the legacy effect, which means that the early control that we help the patients achieve early in their disease actually will help them later on down the road and still provide protection to them as they get older and as they progress in their career with diabetes. We need to take into consideration some patient characteristics. The screen is showing you how to determine an A1C value based on certain patient characteristics, some that we can change, such as their preferences, their support system, what resources they have, but many others that we cannot change, and that is how long they've had diabetes, what complications do they have, what other comorbidities do they have, and what is their risk for hypoglycemia because of medications that we need to use or that they're also on. Taking all of these into consideration, you're going to move that needle for each one of those to either the lower end on the left or to the higher end on the right. And so the further to the right you are for each of those components, the less stringent you want to be with glycemic control. And based on this particular chart, a higher A1C value. But what we have come to appreciate is that while the A1C is still a very important marker, it really doesn't tell us the composition of the glycemic control. It doesn't tell us how often the patients are having hyperglycemia, and more importantly, how often they're having hypoglycemia. We now have this type of information thanks to continuous glucose monitoring, whether it be the professional device that you put on in your office, or whether it be the personal devices that they are using on their own to help manage their blood glucoses rather than doing finger sticks. And we're looking at time and range. We know that raising an A1C doesn't prevent a low blood sugar, but keeping our patients within that target range of 70 to 180 throughout the day does make a difference. And so when we're looking at your more frail patients that have issues that we can't fix and actually make them at great risk for having a hypoglycemic event or worse, an adverse event because of a hypoglycemic event. They could die from it. They could have an arrhythmia, those kind of things. So rather than just raise the A1C, we would just be a little less aggressive with that time and range, but we're even less desirable to have blood glucoses that are less than 70. So again, looking at the composition of what their glycemic control is. So when we look at those key patient characteristics a little bit more closely, what we're looking at here are their current lifestyle. And I like to tie that in with the psychosocial characteristics because that does go hand in hand. How motivated are the patients? Do they suffer from an underlying depression or even an anxiety that gets in their way of their ability to self-care? How active are they? What is their current lifestyle? Are they engaged in physical activity? Do they have a support system around them? Those kind of things. In addition to that, we are also looking clinically. So in addition to their duration of diabetes, what their current A1C level is and where we think it should be, are they overweight or some of our patients are underweight, what other complications, that goes hand in hand also with the comorbidities that we typically see, the chronic kidney disease, heart failure, the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Have they had an event? Are they just enough risk factors that it's a matter of when and not if they're going to have an event? And then we have to tie all of that in with their socioeconomic and cultural context. Where are the patients coming to you from? Where does healthcare fit into their belief system? Do they have access to healthcare insurance? Do they have access to medication plans, how high of a deductible does their insurance have before it kicks in. So these are the things that we need to take into consideration that will help us to really individualize the treatment plan that we are thinking about with our patients. Let's hear again from our patient. Because I went to a dietitian that assists me into better meal planning, 
So I started my meal planning. Um, I've, I've included walking, um, you know, just walking more, which getting more exercise in and actually being mindful as to what I'm eating compared to just, you know, grabbing things and saying, okay, well, let me just manage it after the fact. I'm real family oriented and we like to travel. I need to be able to travel, be able to take my medication with me, need to prepare once I get there. So with that, um, you know, I needed to know how to try, travel, manage my diabetes. I needed to also know, you know, what, what my family needed to do in, in, in the case if I got in any type of danger. So I needed them to be informed as well. I have asthma, I have Crohn's disease, high blood pressure. So those are my, those are my main things um, besides my diabetes. So considering factors impacting the choice of treatment, the American Diabetes Association guidelines, as well as other expert guidelines, have come to prioritize the GLP-1 receptor agonists, as well as SGLT-2 inhibitors, as second-line therapy after metformin for many patients with type 2 diabetes. So the guidelines are actually asking us when we're thinking about intensifying treatment is first to determine, do they already have established cardiovascular disease or chronic kidney disease? And if that's the case, we actually are going to choose medications that will not only address the glycemic control, but that also will convey protection as far as whether or not it's an atherosclerotic predominant nature or a heart failure, chronic kidney predominant. If their A1C is already less than 7% and you're not thinking you need to intensify because of glycemic control, if these patients are not on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, if the disease predominant is really atherosclerotic in nature, or an SGLT2 inhibitor if chronic kidney disease or heart failure predominates, then we need to put them on one of those agents. And if we are thinking of intensifying treatment and they are already on one of those agents, the recommendation is then to add whichever one of those two classes the patient is not on currently. They may have multiple risk factors though. And so the need then becomes, are you trying to reduce their risk for hypoglycemia and minimizing weight gain? It's usually a combination of the two, but Depending on where your angle may be, what you'll see regardless is the GLP-1 receptor agonist class tends to be among the top medications that you as a clinician would want to choose. And the reason for that is its efficacy. When we're looking at the ominous octet, we see pathological issues that are within the body of someone with diabetes, and all of these eight things contribute to that hyperglycemia. And so when we look at the medications that are currently available and we place those medications on the ominous octet, you'll see why the GLP-1 receptor agonist rises to the top. So we have the alpha and the beta cell of the pancreas. The beta cell, of course, makes insulin, that first phase insulin response that is blunted in someone with prediabetes and pretty much absent in someone with type 2. And then the alpha cell, which secretes the counter-regulatory hormone to insulin and is responsible for raising blood sugars when we're fasting. That mechanism is actually triggered by GLP-1, which is an incretin hormone in the gut. And in someone with diabetes, that mechanism is not being signaled properly. So they're missing that first phase insulin response. The alpha cell is not being suppressed, so glucagon is being secreted. The glucagon then goes to the liver. We have the impact on the muscle and the fat as far as disposing. The glucose appropriately is not occurring in someone with type 2 diabetes. The central nervous system is now implicated where satiety centers should be stimulated and they're not. Also, the innervation of the esophagus as well as gastric emptying are a little bit more rapid.
rapid in people with type 2 diabetes. So you see the GLP-1 impacting all of those things for glucose control, and the impact on both the alpha cell and the beta cell are glucose dependent. So when the blood glucoses are not elevated, the impact on the beta cell diminishes, and when the blood glucoses should start to drop below normal, say approaching 70 milligrams per deciliter, definitely by 66 milligrams per deciliter, the impact on suppressing the alpha cell also is reduced, allowing the body to naturally respond to a falling blood sugar, unless, of course, the patient is on an insulin secretagogue or insulin itself, where the body is unable to override those things. So when you think of where native GLP-1 impacts its effects, it's not just on glucose metabolism, and that's why we're seeing all these other pleiotropic benefits from the pharmacological doses of GLP-1 receptor agonists. We see improved cardiac output, reduction in blood pressure. We see weight loss. So there's a lot of other things, not just glucose control, that we can see our patients benefit from. So every drug since 2008 that is going to be used or indicated for the treatment of type 2 diabetes has to go through a rather rigorous study to make sure that the medication is not going to exert any additional harm to patients who are already at a six to eight fold risk of having a cardiac event. And so, as you can see, the cardiovascular outcomes trial are basically looking for a reduction or at least non-inferiority, meaning that it's no more harmful than placebo when compared with standard of care. And so we're usually looking for major adverse cardiovascular events in the form of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. Some other cardiovascular outcomes trials may include some other indicators, such as hospitalization for heart failure or fatal stroke or fatal MI. But most of them are a three-point mace, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. Across the board, GLP-1 receptor agonists are certainly non-inferior, but some have actually shown benefit or superiority. We're also starting to see some impact on kidney as far as good kidney outcomes and reduction in worsening of kidney function with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So stay tuned for more information as that comes out. So again, when we compare all of the classes, most of us are pretty much using the six classes that are listed here, sulfonylureas, insulin, the TZDs, the DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors, and the GLP-1 receptor agonist. How well does it reduce A1C? But again, not just does it reduce A1C, but how safely? without the risk of hypoglycemia and without impacting the weight. And so you see the GLP-1 receptor agonists are at the top of the heap there. And then when you go into the additional benefits, the renal and the cardiovascular benefits, we really do see the GLP-1 receptor agonists shine in that area. The only other difference would be with the SGLT2 inhibitors, and that is because as a class, those drugs have shown tremendous benefit on chronic kidney disease as well as heart failure. So in general, your patient should be using both a GLP-1 receptor agonist and an SGLT2 inhibitor as you need to intensify treatment just because of their synergistic benefits, both metabolic as well as renal and cardiovascular, without the risk of that hypoglycemia that we typically see with some of the other medications. Of the GLP-1 receptor agonists that we currently have available, three of them currently have the cardiovascular indications, and those indications vary slightly depending on how they were studied. All three that are listed here are approved for the secondary prevention, which is to reduce the risk of three-point MACE in adults with type 2 who have established cardiovascular disease. Dulaglutide has the FDA indication to reduce the risk of that three-point MACE in patients who have type 2 diabetes with established cardiovascular disease or multiple risk factors, so not yet having disease. So that is the only one in the class that actually has a primary prevention indication.
So what about kidney status? Because we do know that most of the patients that do have type 2 diabetes tend to be over the age of 65, so they have some age-related kidney decline. And then in addition to that, they probably have had some history of hypertension, which will impact the kidneys as well. So we want to make sure that we are choosing meds appropriately for patients depending on their renal status. We also need to think of how the drugs are metabolized and eliminated from the system. So the ones that have the most restriction as far as renal function are the exenatide products. So the exenatide twice daily, lixizenatide, and then the exenatide long-acting products. Those are excreted through the kidneys and it needs to be used based on a certain kidney function. All of the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, the liraglutide, the dulaglutide, and the semaglutide can be dosed in patients with renal insufficiency. We just need to be mindful of some of the adverse events patients experience, which could be nausea, it could be their inability or desire to want to take in food or liquid, and it could cause some diarrhea for some patients. So anything that reduces how much they take in or increases how much they're putting out can actually worsen underlying kidney disease. So monitoring them, making sure they're doing well, making sure that they're taking in fluids and getting labs as appropriate is a good way to keep an eye on those patients. GLP-1 receptor agonists pretty much across the board have all been shown to have a weight reduction effect on patients. But the GLP-1s that we are currently using for diabetes are not used specifically for weight loss, but we do know that they do help with that. And that really does help our patients on multiple levels. What we do know is that the earlier we start our patients on these, the better they tend to respond. And the better that they tend to respond actually predicts the likelihood that they will adhere to treatment. The higher the change in A1C, the higher the change in weight. And if a patient was lucky enough to have both an A1C and a change in weight, we're seeing that the adherence rates just go up in proportion to that. So it comes in a variety of forms. We have some once-weekly GLP-1 receptor agonists. We also have GLP-1 receptor agonists that are available once daily or twice daily. There's different products available depending on what, of course, is accessible to your patient through their insurance. We now have an oral form that is still once daily. It's the oral semaglutide, which is the same molecule as the injectable semaglutide. So we also need to talk about, well, how is it administered? Other than the oral semaglutide, which is obviously a pill, what else do we need to know? Because our patients come with different abilities or reasons that they may need to use one product over another. And so is a needle visible? Do we need to prescribe needles when we're ordering the medications? Does the patient need to place the needle on the device? And for some patients that are a little needle phobic, and so we have some devices, that have the needle hidden, where the patient doesn't interact with it at all. They don't see it, and they don't have to do anything when administering the medication other than put the device up against their skin. So it just depends on which device is actually available to the patient, but we do have some choices if you need to choose based on dexterity issues, their ability to see clearly. Let's ask our patient her perspective on how she integrated a GLP-1 receptor agonist into her treatment. Well, the way they explained it to me was they gave me my pros and my cons. So they said that this would help assist me with having a better A1C, having to take less medication, um, it was once a week instead of every day. Um, and then it would assist me with my weight gain. So it would allow me not to be as hungry as I was in the past. So those things has been a plus for me because it is definitely working. I have been using the new medication for four to six months now. I want to say six months total. 
after a week of um, using the new medication, I was a, I noticed a, a difference. You know, I wasn't as hungry. I wasn't as thirsty. Um, my, my counts were more normal during the day. And I was like, wow, this is really great because now I can actually schedule my lifestyle instead of, you know, working towards the diabetes, I could allow the diabetes to work with me. So in the beginning, when they wanted to switch me from pills to, to insulin, I had to take it more, take it every day. I had to um, make sure that it was either refrigerated or make sure I didn't leave it. Um, I had to check my um, blood sugar prior to taking it. Um, I had to look at a sliding scale. So it was more in detail. Um, this has gives me one injection once a week. It's the same amount. You know, I don't have to remember that. And um, it, it definitely has taken away the extra anxiety of trying to keep up with all of the different methods. I know exactly what's going on and I'm not having a lot of those high and lows. It's like stay and study. And I, I really like that. In addition to how it's administered, we have to think about how accessible. And typically accessibility means how much is it going to cost? And so that really is gonna depend on insurance. And it's also going to depend on whether or not they are commercially insured or if they receive medication benefits through Medicare or Medicaid. But we do have some things that are available at not only the clinician's fingertips, but also the patient's. I have used retail pharmacies such as GoodRx and some other online products that do allow for some discount pricing. These typically are not used in conjunction with the insurance, so you have to keep that in mind. It doesn't go against their deductible. Things like Prescription Hope, which depending on what their income is, will determine if they can get the brand name medications that are not typically available to patients that are cash payers for a set price every month. Month. So there's a lot of resources out there, and I recommend that you or your office staff become familiar with them. We are now at creating and agreeing on a management plan through shared decision making. So we already talked about a lot of the things that go into helping your patient decide what they think is going to fit their lifestyle. This section is really looking a little bit more deeper at that shared decision making so that we can create a management plan that involves the patient as well as empowers them. We wanna make sure that we're seeking their input, that we're setting those goals for the patient, that it's a mutually set upon goal. Remember, goals need to be measurable. It can be the A1C. It can be how often are you gonna check your blood sugar between now and the next appointment, those kind of things, as well as when to communicate that information back to you or how to communicate that information. Thankfully, there's a lot more going on with telehealth that allows us to do a lot of this without necessarily needing the patient to physically come into a building to see us. The other important thing on shared decision making is making sure that the patient has additional resources and that's where that diabetes self-management education and support classes really come in because it surrounds the patient with a highly skilled diabetes educator who can help them with integrating the diabetes management in their life, but it also surrounds them with others who are also contending with the same life issues and they can support each other and learn off of each other. This is an example of what the Veterans Affairs, the VA, Department of Defense, uses. They use an acronym called SHARE. So what does SHARE stand for? Seek your patient's participation, help your patient explore and compare treatment options, A for assess your patient's values and preferences, 
R, reach for a decision with your patient, and E, evaluate the decision together. That's just one example, but I think because it is a shared decision making that the acronym SHARE just makes it a little easier for me to keep in mind with everything else that I have going on. We have medications that are available as an injectable. I've got patients that are actually happy to take an injectable, especially if it's once a day or even better, once a week. And it doesn't have to be taken in relation to timing of food, timing of other medications. It doesn't have to be morning or night. It really gives them that flexibility and it reduces some of the pill burden because we're not adding more pills to their regimen. I've got some patients that are not on a lot of medications and they prefer to use an oral agent. And then that's where the oral GLP-1 may come into play. So it just depends on what's going on with the patient and offering them choices so that they can decide what they think is going to fit better and what they may be more adherent to. Cost is always going to be an issue for our patients. And unfortunately, that's going to vary based on insurance coverage. I will guarantee you that every insurance plan, whether it be commercial, whether it be Medicaid or Medicare, will carry a GLP-1 receptor agonist on their formulary. And so I encourage you to use whatever is on their formulary so that the patients can get the benefit from these medications. Looking at the individual GLP-1s, this shows you which ones are going to be time dependent. So it typically is with the shorter acting GLP-1s, which is the exenatide twice daily and the lixizenatide that need to be taken before a meal and so many minutes before that meal. Liraglutide is actually a long-acting GLP-1, so even though it's once daily, it doesn't come with those time requirements of before a meal or even a specific time of day. I just ask the patients to be consistent so that they don't forget when they need to take something. The weekly injections have absolutely no time restrictions associated with them at all. They can be taken any time of day. We do ask the patients to just pick a day of the week and be consistent with that day, again, so that they don't forget their medication. The oral semaglutide does come with some dosing restrictions, but because of that reduced bioavailability and the way that it is co-formulated to allow it to be surviving in the gut and yet absorbed in the epithelium of the gut, there's some timing. So we want to make sure that that is on an empty stomach at least 30 minutes before or any food, any other medications, and any additional fluid. But I will tell you that most of the adverse events that we see with all of the GLP-1s, regardless of frequency of day or if it's an injectable or an oral agent, is the GI side effects. So nausea, vomiting sometimes, more likely nausea, constipation and diarrhea are the most common things that we see. They tend to be transient. So our role is to coach our patients through these, reminding them that this is going to change how hungry they are, as well as how frequently they are hungry and how much they're actually able to eat when they are hungry. So I tell my patients, you need to approach food a little differently. Eat when you're hungry. When you are eating, you're going to eat smaller portions and you're going to eat more slowly. And most importantly is stop eating when you feel satisfied, even if you still have just a few more bites on the plate, because just one more bite could be the difference between feeling well and having an adverse event. We also know that eating foods that are high in fat tend to slow down the gut naturally anyway, but we will see more adverse events if patients are consuming meals that are high in fat when they are on GLP-1 receptor agonists. Headache is seen, again, think of how these medications work. They're working on the satiety centers of the brain, so it is possible that they may experience a headache. We treat that just like we would any other headache, and again, these tend to get better with time. The only medication that will actually cause the issue with nodules at the injection site is actually with the exenatide ER product, and that is because of the formulation 
composition of this molecule. It's actually based in a polymer. So if you think about stitches, sutures that are within the body that dissolve after a certain period of time, the polymer is the same that is used with the exenatide long acting. And so those nodules are harmless but they can be disturbing for a patient if they weren't expecting them. They do go away with time, the patient's not to manipulate them, and they are to not inject into them. So sometimes patients may also be on insulin. They're going to need to avoid those sites and not inject insulin into them. So we talked about goals needing to be measurable and how do we come across developing them. So the acronym SMART, we want them to be specific. So for instance, we're going to start a GLP-1 receptor agonist today. Today, the one you decided is X. And so we're going to start you out at this particular dose. And if it's one of those where you're going to up escalate the dose, you're going to tell the patient how long they're actually going to be on that dose before they increase, what day of the week the patient gets to choose the day of the week, the time of day if it's a once daily, and then how soon you would like to see them, but then giving the patient the option of perhaps making that a telehealth visit rather than needing to come into the appointment. I find that that has really made accessibility to me as well as other healthcare providers much more likely to occur, especially in our patients who work or are at home caring for elderly parents or children and then making sure that we have a goal of when we're going to reassess them. Let's ask our patient now how she was involved in that process. So the A1C, I wanted to get that down and I wanted it to stay down. I also, um, over the years, I've taken over 20 years, I've been taking, I've been doing um, you know, all types of medicines that allowed me to gain weight. And the weight gain was really not good for me and my other health issues. So, you know, to try, try to see, they said this would assist in that along with getting your A1C down, keeping you from going up and down, having a whole lot of highs and a whole lot of lows. So that right there, I said, okay, let's do it. I'm ready. This has been totally different because of the fact um, taking insulin, it would give me a quick drop that I didn't like. Um, so I had to be ready to eat if, even if I wasn't hungry. Um, so that I didn't like. But this, not having to take it like that anymore has definitely changed because now I can more manage my meal planning, you know, exactly when I want to eat compared to having to eat. Now I can eat when I'm hungry. They said to me, once a week. I said, yes, that's already a no brainer because every day to once a week was going to cut down a lot of my trying to make sure that I am doing all of my regiments to get ready to inject myself um, every day. Um, now only having to do it once a week, that has been life changing for me and my family because, you know, when you go through something with diabetes, the whole family goes through it with you. All of my goals are being met and my needs for sure, because now that I don't need as much medication, um, I don't have to concern myself with, you know, every day remembering to do something. And my goal as to the weight loss and having a better um, blood sugar count during the day has been met. So with the GLP-1, only challenge that I had in the beginning was the lows. I would get a low blood sugar if I did not eat. And it was, I wasn't hungry. 
So I didn't know, okay, well, let me go eat something. I would feel the shakiness of the diabetes. And I said, oh my goodness, let me check. And sure enough, every time it was dropping. So my doctors were totally involved. I gave them a call. They said, you're taking too much of the other medicine. Let's suggest it. And they did it immediately and that stopped. But after they fixed it, adjusted the other medications, removed them, lowered them, I haven't had that problem anymore. All right, so now we've got our plan. We need to monitor and make sure that we're heading along the right path together. Every visit, you should be checking in with your patient and just making sure they're doing well. Ask them, how are you doing? How's everything going? Sometimes it's not the diabetes that you're talking about. It's other life events. Again, keeping in mind the incidence of depression in patients with diabetes. We want to make sure they're tolerating their medication okay, that they're not experiencing any adverse events or side effects that we were not expecting. And how do we then address those with the patient? We also have tools that we can use. We can either use a blood glucose meter or we have now the personal continuous glucose monitoring devices that have become rather affordable and very prevalent out there that patients can use. They don't even need any special training. They can get it with a prescription, go home, apply it, and start using it right away. Let's hear again from our patient. I am on the um, monitor that's, that I have to scan. So it's one of the um, monitors that I just injected on my arm that I just scan my own self. Don't have to pluck my fingers any longer. So I'm still scanning the same amount of time. But what I notice is before it was high and low, up and down. Now it's staying steady across all day, no matter when I check it. It's in, it's in a normal range. And I'm like, that has been tremendous. That's a great big change because before it was either up or down or it would be in range or would be dropping, but that's not the case now. Um, it's more stable and more steady. I am in 95% in range. I have not been in that type of range in the last... Oh my goodness, uh, 19 years. <laughs> so what are the guidelines for follow-up? Well, the American Diabetes Association recommends that patients should be seen at least every three months if they're making progress, more often if they're not. I find that most of these medications, with the exception of probably the GLP-1 receptor agonists, especially the longer acting, take a little while to achieve steady state. So glucose control isn't going to be great right away. So making sure that while the glucoses may not be at the target that you're hoping to see within the next three months, they should be trending downward. So again, helping to set up that expectation of what you're expecting with the patient so that they don't get discouraged and they understand that they are on the right track. I find that I can use my other teammates, my medical assistants, your nursing assistants, even the front desk personnel can reach out, call a patient and say, hey, how are things going? What can we do to help you? And I find that the more often a patient is reached out to, the better they actually do because they feel that they are in a trusting relationship and they're more likely to tell you if things are going not so great, but also more likely to tell you when things are going really well and we all could use a cheerleader now and then. So the last part of the shared decision-making is really to review everything and agree on the plan. And so going through the full decision, looking at the management plan, making sure that what they thought would work for them is still working, that they're not having a problem because something changed in their employment status or something has changed with who's around them and they no longer feel comfortable implementing the treatment. So when do you want to see patients more 
often or when would you want to revise those plans? Well, that's probably a no-brainer. Anytime they're not doing well, either they're having problems tolerating the medication or despite the medication and despite adherence, their glycemic control is not where you want it to be. Even though the GLP-1 receptor agonists won't cause hypoglycemia, they may be on some other medications that do. So always reviewing the signs and the symptoms of a low blood sugar, making sure that if they are having those symptoms, that we are adjusting their other medications and pulling off the agents that are actually responsible for causing those. Let's hear from our patient. So you need to be open, you know, let your provider know exactly what your lifestyle is so that they'll know how to assist you. You know, I was very clear about, you know, I like to travel. I like to go to the football games and, and activities with my grandchildren. So I wanted to be able to still do those things and be able to manage my health as, along the way. And all of those things have been addressed up front prior to me getting started with my new medication. In conclusion, hopefully what you have gleaned from today's talk is how important shared decision-making is to the diabetes management plan. It really does help establish a better patient and clinician partnership, which increases not only the patient satisfaction, but it increases the clinician satisfaction. And we know that when both of us are happy, I think the patient tends to actually do so much better. We also see that the GLP-1 receptor agonists are the action heroes of diabetes management. They are the most efficacious when it comes to the pathology of the disease. They have the greatest A1C reduction when you look at other classes. They don't come with the risk of hypoglycemia, and they tend to not make the weight that our patients are dealing with worse. We now have data on several of the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are available that show some cardiovascular benefit. Every single agent in the class actually has shown to be non-inferior, meaning cardiovascular safe for our patients. But again, the three that I mentioned earlier that actually have the indication on the label to actually help with reducing the risk of that three-point mace. And of course, there are gonna be agent-specific differences. The needle, the needle size, does this patient have to put it on? Is it once daily dose? Is it once weekly? Does it need to be with food? Can it be without food? All of those things that will, and the side effect profile that we need to discuss with the patient so that they can make the decision on how they want to incorporate that into their treatment plan, and it will allow us to better individualize therapy for them as well. I hope you found today's presentation to be helpful. I want to thank you all for your participation today, and we appreciate your time and attention. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash SVU 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. For further information concerning Lilly Grant funding, visit www.lillygrantoffice.com. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.